What's up, everybody? My name is Sungay Chafel, and this is Talking Cinema. Cinema, in all of its essence, is captivating, to say the least. It reflects and perhaps even imitates or foreshadows the cultural, economic, socio-political spheres of the time. An art form, entertainment, intended to make us laugh or cry, immersing us, surrounding us, and making us a part of the story but it also makes us think. In a lot of ways, cinema is a window into who we are as human society, mirroring life, ultimately showcasing the intricate and complex stories that makes up the human heritage. And on that note, let me introduce my guest, a very good friend of mine, a former colleague as a television producer right here in BBS, a film lecturer at RTC, but most importantly, known internationally for his acclaimed award-winning film, a documentary feature film, The Next Guardian. Let me introduce to you my good friend, Arun Batrai. Thank you so much for having me here. Of course, you're more than welcome. How are you, by the way? I'm good, I'm good. Actually, uh, it's a bit of a homecoming for me. Whenever I come to BBS, I remember the good old days and uh, my career started here. That's right. So it's, it's great. Um, thank you for having me on the show. As a filmmaker, and I know internationally, globally, we're going through the situation of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, how has that affected you as a filmmaker? Well, uh, actually, it has also affected uh, me the same way that it has affected many people around the world. Uh, this is uh, mainly because I rely a lot on international funding for my films and because of the pandemic situation right now it's uh, very difficult to to get a lot of fundings because a lot of the fundings are stopped or paused at the moment but you know like we have to keep on filming keep on doing what we like to do so and wait and see and hope for the best. That's right we're all hoping and waiting to see and especially with the vaccination rolling out it, the situation will surely get better. And uh, yes, like you said, the show must go on. We have to film, we have to tell stories. Mm -hmm. And on that note, let's uh, talk about The Next Guardian, your feature documentary film. Uh, it's a feature documentary film that is pretty much traveled all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, IDFA, International Documentary Film Festival, Amsterdam, uh, San Francisco International Film Festival in 2018, Budapest International Documentary Festival 2018, and official selection screening at the MoMA, New York, and others as well. So please tell us a little bit more about that. Well, um, actually, when I started making the film, actually, I, right after I resigned from BBS, I did this film, and co I co-directed this film with, uh, with a classmate of mine with whom I studied in Europe. Uh, her name is Dorothea Zurbo, and she's a prominent Hungarian filmmaker. Mm. So when... Actually, uh, when we finished the film, we didn't really expect that it will move on to like about like 40 different film festivals sure. around the world. 40 different film festivals. Yes. And Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, uh, the film, uh, it's largely, it's, it's about generation gap. Okay. And uh, um, I follow a family in Bumthang. It's yes. a very simple uh, story about a family. It's a triangle where the father wants to... Uh, pass down the family monastery mm -hmm. to, to the son, mm -hmm. but the son wants to play football. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, the, the man, uh, the father, he also has a, has a daughter yes. who identifies herself as a transgender. Yes. And she has a beautiful relationship with yes. the brother. And she, if given a chance, would actually want to take over the monastery instead of the brother. Right. So I wanted, I kind of explored this triangle uh, within the microcosm of this uh, family monastery. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a simple story about generation gap, which is very relevant, I think, in Bhutan. Very much so, very much relevant. It, it speaks of the time of what's happening here in Bhutan. And I've, I've watched the film. I was actually invited, you actually invited me to the screening here in Thimpu. I forget what year it was when you did screen it here in Thimpu. And it was a beautiful, beautiful film. And uh, let me just uh, let me just uh, uh, just read out some of the reviews that have been uh, that have been said about the film. Um, the film is basically about a family on a crossroad between keeping an age-old tradition, 
and an ever-changing modern dichotomy, beautifully showing the contrasting dreams of two different generations at a verge of major change, coming to terms with traditions of the past and the desires of a world that is changing in the present. It is a film, uh, mostly, I mean, you could, you could also argue that it's about the growing pains, um, especially with the uh, two main characters, Tashi and Gimbo, yes. the son and the daughter. Yes. But the film also includes so many nuances, especially uh, Tashi, the girl, who is a transgender, uh, and she wants to play football. And like you said, she would possibly even take over uh, taking care of the monastery. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, how did the film even come about? Oh, well, uh, I think just like in any other documentary, we, you start with something and, sure. uh, and, you know, like the direction changes. So initially I wanted to make a film about a young footballer in the, in the football academy in Gelefu because okay. uh, in 2015, uh, the first professionally trained uh, women team was uh, beginning to take shape in Bhutan. Mm, mm. And I went to the football academy there mm. and uh, I really wanted to do something with, with this crossroads of uh, modernity and tradition and a story about young people. Mm. It also comes from my own experience working in BBS because sure. I, I used to make a lot of children programs here. Sure, I remember, yes. Yeah. And then I was really interested in this subject. So I went there and I met a, a, a shy uh, young girl like Tashi. Right. Uh, and she was very shy, but she was very open about her own uh, identity, you know, at that time. And she was about 14 years at that time. And with Tashi, when I went to, to our home in Bumthang, that's where I met the family. And that's where I saw that uh, the father wants to pass down this family monastery to his son. And I saw that Tashi and her brother, Gimbo, they had a really beautiful relationship. So that's how, that's how the story unraveled. And then I spent a lot of time in their home, like living with them. And they really accepted me and trusted me. And so uh, that way I could really film a lot of observational moments with, sure. with, with the family without really interfering too much with their everyday life, but uh, capturing their life as it is. Like after some time, uh, uh, you know, like I understood the family routine so much right. that I, I knew where I should place myself with the camera. Which I yeah. have to say, I mean, it's, it's beautifully done because when you're watching the film, uh, you almost forget the camera is there. Uh, uh, and which just goes to show that you probably spent so much time with them that you placed the camera or placed yourself in a particular place where it doesn't even seem like the camera is there. So it's an enjoyable way to watch this documentary feature film mm -hmm. uh, without having that disturbance of, oh, the camera is there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some intimate moments between Tashi and Gembo when they're talking or whispering mm -hmm. about girls. Uh, uh, that they're interested in, mm -hmm. and you could totally forget where the camera is. Mm -hmm. But before we go anywhere, mm -hmm. check out the teaser, and this is the teaser, and you'll know what I mean. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Let's talk about more about the film in itself. Um, please, continue. Well, uh, when I was doing the film, I, I didn't really think of a structure of, mm. of the film, like a beginning, middle and end. Although mm. um, I, I'm into creative documentary and creative documentaries, you, uh, you can kind of view it in a similar way as fiction in the sense that it also has a narrative arc. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we deal a lot with the emotions of the characters, sure. uh, with, a, with a beginning, middle and some kind of catharsis yes. in the end. And, but when I was actually shooting it, I was looking at it more from the prism of, uh, of this relationship between, mm. between the family members. Mm. So I was shooting a lot and mm. we had about 200 hours of footage after about two years yes. on and off. I used to go visit Boomtang. Sometimes I also used to go to the football academy because Tashi was still playing there mm. at that time. And we didn't really think too much about the structure. And the structure of the film actually came out during the editing. Okay. So we did the editing in, in, in Hungary. And during that time, uh, you know, like in, in documentary, I think uh, the difference between documentary and fiction is that uh, usually uh, you start writing the script during the editing process. Sure, sure. <laughs> so, so the, yeah, so the actual structure of the film came out during the editing. All right, so we, we, we talk about structure, and I know you spend a lot of time with the family. Um, obviously, with the structure and story, um, as a documentary, we usually tend to show as it is. Mm -hmm. Did you have to somewhat uh, manipulate their characters mm -hmm. or sort of structure their characters in a way to fit the film and the story mm -hmm. uh, for it to to be coherent? Mm -hmm. The characters are basically who they are. Mm. I mean, I, 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 I took a lot of time to understand who Tashi is, mm. you know, like, and who Gembo is. Like, Gembo is very shy. Okay. He doesn't want to revolt against his father. Mm. The maximum he can do is maybe doze off while the father is giving him a long lecture, sure. you know? Like, he didn't really want to revolt. So I didn't want to tell him, hey, why don't you talk back to your father sure. because that was not his character. Sure. But on the other hand, the father was more, he was very proud of his culture. Okay. So he, he would often talk a lot with me as well. Sure. And in the film, you see moments where he's actually talking, talking to, to me as camera. well. Exactly. Yeah, talking right. to the camera yes. as well. And also to, 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 to his son. Right. So I, I, I try to stay as true to their characters okay. as possible. But of course, there are certain moments where you want as a filmmaker, right? right? Like you, you'd like... Uh, maybe a scene where where the siblings are going to an archery match and you right. know like talking about the right. archery where maybe the villagers will make fun of Tashi's transgender sure. identity sure. you know like so for that I actually ask them hey why don't we go to an archery match or why don't we go to a riverside mm. but those are things that they would do mm. other times mm. but wouldn't do when I was there right. so I would take them to these moments to kind of provoke uh, certain conversations sure so, so in a lot of ways you have to perhaps even, like you said, provoke or recreate a particular yes. scene, perhaps, and hoping that it will go your way, yes. of how you have visioned it. Yes, initially it, initially it sounds uh, kind of fake, you right. know, like when they right. start to talk, right. but then after some time, because you have spent so much time with them, right. that they forget about the camera, and then right. they start to like have a very spontaneous conversation. Right. So that's and how truly I- Truly be themselves. Yeah, truly be themselves. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll get, Further into uh, one point that you mentioned about Tashi being a transgender and perhaps maybe the villagers even making fun of her mm -hmm. for being uh, a transgender. Yeah. We'll get to that. Yeah. But what I want to know is um, uh, your feelings on, well, the film has been recognized internationally. Mm -hmm. Like you said, 40 different festivals all over the world. Mm -hmm. How is the film perceived here in Bhutan? Well, it's uh, it's it's been pretty good in the sense that uh, we did uh, we did uh, first uh, a screening in in uh, in one of the theaters here sure. and a lot of people came and the reception was very nice i was very nervous mm -hmm. because i think uh, a film should be liked by the local audience like right. first and that because uh, the way the local audience reads the film is very different from how the international audience re reads it, right? Sure. So I, the reception was good. Then after that, we did some kind of a traveling cinema mm. through Bhutan. Mm. So we went to different schools. Mm. 
we even went to some like villages and sure. we took our own projector and we took our own wow. equipment and then we screened this film to to like some villages and uh, uh, of course the language is most of the language in the film is in Bumtap so that was a bit difficult right. when we screen it to places where they cannot read English subtitles sure, sure. but still the reception was pretty good and people could identify with the characters and there was a moment in one of the screenings where I, I, I kind of remember mm. because uh, one student, uh, he, he, got, he got up uh, while I was screening it uh, to, to a school mm. in, in Ha, mm. and then he, he said that, oh, he can really identify with uh, Gembo's inner conflict, sure, you know? Sure. And then he was also forced by his father to stay back uh, in the village and take care of the cattle, but he somehow managed to come to school. school. So. I, so that was a really good moment for me. So generally, it has been well received. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that Although, of course, go ahead, of yeah. course, I would have loved to take it more to to different places uh, around Bhutan. Bec uh, as you know, like we have so, so few theaters, and right. this film is specifically made for the cinema, mm. so that people can experience mm. the 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 lives of the characters sure. that we see sure. in the film. So, but because of the lack of theaters. Uh, we couldn't take it to, to like as many places as, as we would have wanted it to go to. Sure. But uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty happy with, with the reception and I would actually, it's been a few years since I made the film, but I would love to have it screened, you know, like more in Bhutan and for more people to watch it. And I think that's true because uh, most of these films made by independent uh, filmmakers like yourself are not really known within Bhutan. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, they might be known internationally, and they, they do us really proud by representing Bhutan and sort of promoting Bhutan in a lot of ways. But uh, I kind of feel like our Bhutanese audience, either they don't understand the film mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. they just don't like the stylistic uh, mm -hmm. way of the film, uh, how the film mm -hmm. uh, features. Uh, be, uh, and that has nothing to do with how the mainstream film does, but mm -hmm. uh, because the mainstream film has their own... A formula of how they want to engage the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the difficulties, perhaps, uh, maybe in in that sense of how the Bhutanese audience is not aware of films like this? Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 about uh, it's also about uh, yeah. We don't really have a culture of uh, watching, let's say, art films right. or creative documentaries. You know. Uh, it's, it comes when people watch more, more, more of these kind of films, and it's also the the fact is also that um, that uh, people haven't had the chance or the opportunity to watch more of this kind of cinema. I think, sure. and uh, if we if we can promote this kind of films and take it to different places, then then I think the the, the culture of uh, watching this kind of films is because I think the the the. The difference is that in in the commercial films, it's in so, it's some form of like big entertainment, sure, right? It's it's sure. it's escaping. There's a wow factor. Already yes, yes, yes. In that. So it it uh, I think uh, there is a big escapism from sure, from from sure. reality. Sure. But uh, I think uh, when it comes to uh, to art films, it's it's more it's more what you said in the beginning. You just like it kind of helps us to recognize our own place in the society reflect and reflect our own lives basically. reflect our own lives and also um, uh, you know like uh, it uh, yeah it, it makes us uh, think think about individuals and also empathize with 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 the characters that right. we see right. in the film for example in documentary we uh, for about 90 minutes we enter the shoes of the of the main characters right. and right. live their lives right. so i think it uh, it creates empathy and mm. I think that's the main purpose of mm. of uh, of creative documentaries and art art films in general that it, it kind of helps us to to empathize with minority or sure. empathize with uh, people who are a little different from others right. and kind of recognize otherness and so so it has the, it has that goal and I think um, it the right now we are bombarded a lot with with a lot of uh, Bollywood and Hollywood and uh, we, and our commercial uh, cinema is particularly influenced by that kind of film. These I'm, major, and, huge yeah, production. Yeah, uh, which is of course like it has. It's I mean nothing nothing wrong charm, with it. Right, yeah. yeah, but uh, but art cinema at the same time, if like you can really enjoy it and it's 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 like it's like reading a painting or a good 
book, you know, like sure, so, yeah. So why do you think it's uh, why do you think it's is that situation here? Is it because we don't have enough promotion to that, enough uh, education in terms of reading these art uh, or watching these art films For, in a in a in a, yeah. in a film linguistic way? Are we not? understanding it as an yeah. audience or firstly i think firstly i think we don't have a we don't have a film education here mm. in, in in the country mm. and that would really help mm. uh, and uh, secondly i think um, yeah it's, it's i think it's uh, it's basically yeah it's actually the main the main reason is 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 uh, and then there is no cultural funding for films sure, here. Sure. So there's no cultural funding. So uh, we have to kind of make the audiences outside a priority because if you get funding from France, then we have to show the film in France first. That's right. And it becomes a French production. Right. It doesn't even it, become a Bhutanese Bhutani, production. It's just Bhutanese yeah. director yes, yes. making a film here in Bhutan, but yeah. it's funded from France, France, so it has to be shown in France. Yeah. So, so that culture needs to be somewhat uh, recognized and seen in order for it to be changed. Yes, perhaps. and it's it's also you know like of course right now we as independent filmmakers we cannot demand the government that oh we need a lot of money also because we understand that we are still a developing country right. here. But at the same time, what we could do is we could encourage uh, encourage uh, uh, independent. We could encourage firstly film schools here right. in the country. Okay. And secondly, we could we should encourage uh, independent filmmakers to bring foreign crew from outside sure. here sure. Who, who can work with with the local crew here sure. and then that's also that also helps local filmmakers in terms of learning in terms craft. of learning as well yeah. in, ter in terms of the craft so you know uh, because we 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 have uh, right now like we we don't have studios as well here so we have to take our film outside mm. and even if we would have studios here i know that there is a plan here to make mm. a big studio here mm. but even if we have studios here we need manpower we need skilled people. If we have studios here, but we are going to bring people from outside to do the editing, then it doesn't make too much sense for right. me. It so doesn't become a homegrown product. Yes, it doesn't become a home homegrown product. So right now we, yeah, we we, it's a, it's the obvious choice for independent filmmakers is to apply for sure. film foundations outside, producers outside, television stations outside. Sure. Yeah. Well, that makes it a little bit difficult, but we are on our way. I mean, we have uh, a bunch of uh, freelance filmmakers who are still at it, mm -hmm. making films, mm -hmm. telling good stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, if you really think about it, we are headed towards the right direction. Yeah. We just need everything to sort of line up in yeah, a way yeah, that, yeah. Uh, that supports independent filmmakers like that. But let's get back to the film, uh, your film, The Next Guardian. Now, these are the troubles as an overall general sense of yeah, making but films. I would like to mention one more thing before we carry on. Sure, that, sure. Uh, before I forget to mention sure, it later. please do. <laughs> so, uh, I think what, what is important is also that now we cannot think like that film is just like a... It's, we cannot make a film just for Bhutanese audiences, I think. Or now it's a very international medium. Truly said, yes. Yeah. The film has become a very international medium. So we need to f make films we, which can be relatable like universally, you know, right. like with, with universal themes or universal messages. Right. Like a film that I make here, someone else in another part of the globe could, relate to could, should be able to relate, it, relate to it. And I think that's really important. If you can actually make that kind of cinema, mm. then then you can automatically make your product marketable, you know. Sure. And... Sure. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's really important. And in a lot of ways, I kind of think uh, that that the foundation of that is just a good story, isn't mm -hmm. it? If yeah, you have to start with a good story. A good um, story always ha has a, has a has to be relatable universally. Exactly. Yeah, because we I, are human after all. Exactly. Regardless of what culture you're coming from, what exactly. country you're coming from, some things, yes. some very core essence of uh, humanness is relatable all over the world. Exactly. Story exactly. is the key. And like you said, yes, uh, we definitely need to target uh, our films or make it relatable more towards yes. the international uh, realm, yes. not just here in Bhutan. Yes, yes, but obviously, we want to concentrate it here as well. Yes, I agree. Right? Yes. yes. Um, so as I was saying before, um, let's talk about the difficulties. I mean, were there some difficulties when you were filming um, um, The Next Guardian? Yes, uh, I mean, there are a lot of di difficulties for independent filmmakers. One of the 
bigger difficulties which uh, we don't really talk about so much is is that often independent filmmakers or I, I don't really I can't talk too much about the commercial filmmakers here mm. because I, I, I don't really know but at least me as an independent filmmaker you are often looked at with a bit of suspicion by by in in, in the government like when you approach like government ministries organizations or, organizations okay. or schools you know where you need to go to get permission to shoot sure or even to distribute your film you are looked at with a bit of suspicion it's it's because you don't belong to the government setup sure. i know it because i have worked a lot for bbs sure you know like i worked many years here and okay. i know how i i would be treated when if i you come are as, as someone working for BBS sure. and how you are treated when you come as someone as an independent person or okay. the term is that private, private. person. Okay. So, you know, like, so uh, there is a big suspicion that if that itself is removed, you know, like we also want to make beautiful films and, right. and we are also making it for the larger good of the society exactly. in some way. So, so I think that that distinguish that what differentiation shouldn't be there. That's sure. what I feel. Is that the biggest hurdle? Uh, the bigger biggest hurdle I would say is more like um, it's 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 the funding. It's mm. it, that's the biggest hurdle, mm. and um, because we don't have funding here, then we have to keep on. We have to rely on funding outside. And of course, like there is no culture of watching. Uh, independent films in, in Bhutan so much, which is being developed right now. But uh, because of that, we don't have a big market here. Mm. So some, some form of support, uh, financial support or some form of support from, 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 from the government here would, would really help independent filmmakers. But let me get this right. It's not obviously we are a developing nation, so uh, to expect fundings and whatnot is not completely... Um, at the moment, mm. uh, it, it's very hard to get funding, yeah, yeah, yeah. let's say. Uh, but it's not without support, obviously. Mm. Uh, you were, we were discussing uh, the other day on uh, the Beskop. Uh, tell, us, tell us about that. Yeah, Beskop so, uh, Bhutan. Yeah, I mean, Beskop Bhutan is a very uh, private initiative okay. that's, that's started by Dichin Roder. So, okay. so there, uh, there are a lot of... Uh, I think she's beginning the Besco of Bhutan, which is like a online platform right. where you can pay a small amount of money sure. and watch a lot of independent films that uh, uh, that she has put up on the platform. And I think it's a really great initiative. It's mm. a really great individual initiative. Mm. And of course, the, my film, The Next Garden, is also there. And, okay. and people, who, if, if they would like, they can go there and pay a small amount of money. They can embob right. and then they can watch it. And right. the platform, uh, the, it's, uh, it's also open in internationally. So people sure. can also watch the, the Bhutanese independent films on, on Besko Bhutan from outside of Bhutan. Uh, talking about uh, watching it and being able to watch it, I know The Next <laughs> Guardian and I need to congratulate once again. You could also catch The Next Guardian on Amazon Prime. Yes. Uh, <laughs> what else? What other platforms? Well, right now it's on Amazon, Amazon Prime Video. It's on Google Play mm. and it's also on Vimeo On Demand. Mm. And in Bhutan, it's on Besco Bhutan. Well, there you have it, uh, ladies and gentlemen. If you're interested in watching The Next Guardian, you can catch it on these platforms. Uh, check out this particular snippet of the video from the film, and we'll be right back. Love Guru. Guru? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 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 Everything I can get is not too much. 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 Too
se la daf buena. Tempri, y de no lo hemos obtido, pero... Da, adoro por todo. Te llamo no muy mal, le tamo no, ha una ni que ani que. Chopte, chopte de pego mi regino. Hap chan nang no no mando. Ne ma pone muta. Que que lo no soy que no me da modo. ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่
I think so, but at the same time, I, I feel like there is no open discrimination. Sure. There's no open discrimination, sure. but there is uh, discrimination under discrimination the surface. Underneath the surface. Yes, sure, there is. Sure. Because okay. I, yeah, I mean, I, I was filming Tashi for a long time, and I know that when she is not there in the frame. People talk about her okay. in, the, in the background. So sure. there's there's no open discrimination here. But under the carpet, you know, sure. the, under the surface, yes. there is some kind of discrimination. But her as well. family was. But the, totally her family was very very is. accepting. Yes, okay. very accepting. It was very it's, it was a very natural part of of their everyday life. So okay. that was what what drew me to them firstly, and then later when I found out that the father was not very. Uh, uh, you know, father didn't want to compromise when it comes to the culture, and mm. he wanted uh, Gembo sure. to take over the monastery. You know, you, you there's a certain rigidity, <laughs> rigidity to the tradition there. And yes, the, the the boy, the older boy, has yes. to take care yes. of the monastery. So yeah. here there were like these two two different sides of the father, and I thought that was really really interesting. So and it played out really well mm -hmm. in the film because it gives it that tension. Somebody, uh, a character, Tashi's character, who who's a transgender, yes. who wants to play football, yes. who's willing to even take over the family heritage of yes. taking care of the monastery. Yes, yes. Meanwhile, Gembo doesn't want, want to, to, but tradition not allows it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's just it's just an interesting dichotomy that that plays out in the film. Yes, yes, yes. And then I basically, like I was telling you earlier, I wanted to stay true to their characters mm. without kind of uh, judging, like mm. who is right or who is wrong. I think a lot of people are on the father's side. A lot mm. of people I, I show them to, they're like, we understand the father. Okay. And there are a lot of people who are also on the side of Gimbo and they're okay. like, oh, why, why the father is pushing uh, so much. But at the same time, uh, they like the, I, the, the film also has a very open ending in the yes, sense that... Uh, the we don't know who's taking we, care of the Yeah, because in the I end. wanted to emphasize this dilemma that the father has, right? Sure. Like uh, whether he should force the son or not. He doesn't really want to force him as well. But at the same time, he cannot help it for, for the sake of culture, I and would tradition. say, and tradition. And his own home, I guess, is his property also in some way, but that's like an ancestral property that came from up to down. Right. So if uh, Gimbo wouldn't take care of the monastery, maybe the government would take over the monastery. Sure. So, you know, like he, he has that dilemma as well. So I, I really wanted to play with that without really judging who is right or who is wrong. Right, and yeah. it's beautifully done because, I mean, when you watch the film, you see the character how strong each of the character is within the film and how, how they deal with each other mm -hmm. uh, in that subtle way. Mm -hmm. And it's very fitting of the time because I think Bhutan, like I mentioned before, we are going through that. Yes. There's a lot of people out there in the villages, even here within Thimpu, that are going through that changes. Yes. Although uh, some parts are faster changing than the others. Yes. But that's, that's why it's so relevant here in Bhutan as well. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and also, uh, like, I think it's also the, the beauty of uh, documentary that you start with a, with a certain uh, idea, topic, and then the, it just keeps on changing. But I think as a, as a documentary filmmaker, you should be willing to move with the, with the story without having a very rigid point of view. Sure like sure. yourself, but you move move with the story and then you keep on exploring, keep on exploring until the point where you think that, oh, a film is going to come out from it. Sure. Now, mm. is that like one of the main differences between a, a fictional film where you're structured by the script, the screenplay, uh, probably the scenery, whatnot? Is that one of the major differences in terms of docu documentary feature films yes. where you are free to go wherever the character yes. drives you or the story drives you? Yes, uh, I think uh, in, in fiction, it's, uh, it's like uh, the, the director or the screenwriter, write, they write the characters, right. right? They write that, oh, this is how the character looks. Right. Of course, they also write it based on their own sure. personal experiences right. and the people they have seen or the culture they come from. But in 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 doc documentary often the the characters take you on a ride <laughs> like so you have to adjust to the character the like how the character is like they are like that you cannot change them so that's how i think that's the difference and um, so you need to be able to adjust the story to where the character's life takes you sure. so and that's the beauty of documentary i think because it's always an exploration so is that is that the reason why you have to take s why you uh, uh, particularly took so long in the editing and that's where the narrative actually yes uh, that's where you actually figured out the narrative 
on the editing part yes, of the production. Yes, yes, it, it it was during the editing that that we we came up with a structure, and of course you need to be. You need to stay true to to who the character is because if we show fragments from the character's life, uh, the audience won't understand who this character right. is. Right. So during the editing process, uh, we need to build build this. So that's sure. a major challenge in in documentary. In right. in fiction, obviously, you already wrote who the character is. So while editing, you there's you edit, but you know it because the, already the script is there in right. front of you and you spend so many it's, so many times with yes, the yes. characters in the family as yes, well yes yes so you have somewhat of a know-how of know who how. they are yes and it's 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 a big challenge because when you show the film to the characters right later uh, because they, they 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 are also going to judge you and they, they right. so uh, you should be in the end able to show the film to to the characters who also trusted you sure yeah <laughs> oh that's a very beautiful beautiful thing uh i'm just curious um uh, well, yes, you have worked here in BBS. You've done documentaries. You've worked with a lot of children. You've made children's program, mm -hmm. youth program. Um, who, what influenced you basically into documentary filmmaking? Or is there any particular person, uh, do documentary filmmaker, mm -hmm. or perhaps even filmmaker, mm -hmm. directors that have influenced you in your life that, yeah. that sort of made you pursue this? Yeah, actually, I was... Uh, well, I, I think it's... Uh, I, you know, like you and I, we, we, we come from, from a generation where, where, where I, I grew up with a lot of watching a lot of Bollywood films, right? right. And you know that uh, like television came so late to Bhutan right. here. So I think all of us always have a fascination for cinema, every, everyone generally, right. because it was mysterious. It was not something that you could see, touch. It was so it was hard to watch a film. Right. Like you have to go to a VHS shop bring it watch it it was a difficult it was process a deal, yeah wasn't it? you couldn't <laughs> find it uh, on, on your phones you know like it was difficult to get it so that's why i think that fascination for me personally came from there mm. and then later i joined joined bbs and that's where i kind of learned the initial b basic trade of uh, of uh, structuring a, a documentary mm. but then after um, um, uh, 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 actually, it was during BBS. I went for my masters to to Europe, and I did a program called as Doc Nomads. Mm. So, in in this Doc Nomads program, there are like twenty students from all around the world who travel to different universities in Europe and oh, wow. le and learn about filmmaking. So, actually, that's where I really got influenced and entered into this creative documentary field, mm. which has a very similar language to fiction, but it is real. Mm. So. Uh, that's where I really got influenced uh, to, to, to making documentaries. And there I met, like, uh, not met, but kind of learned about a lot of uh, great documentary filmmakers like mm. Viktor Kozakovsky, who is a mm. Russian filmmaker. There is Eliona Venderost, who is a Dutch filmmaker. So mm. they became kind of some of my influences. And, mm -hmm. and that's how I really went into, into documentary filmmaking. Would you be making another docu feature documentary or are you even interested in making fictional feature films? Yeah, so actually uh, I don't, dr I, for me there is a very, very thin line between what is documentary and what is fiction. Sure. Because a lot of fiction is also based on reality, right? right? And so... Is the age-old question of yes, art yes. imitating life or life imitating art yes, in a lot of yes, ways, I guess you yes. could say. So I, 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 I would probably make a fiction... Um, Mm, at some point in time, but right now, when I, the stories that I encounter, I don't really feel the need to 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 enter into fiction like sure. consciously. You know, like the stories that interest me mostly are about really ordinary people, okay. very micro situations, sure. and I and I like the fact that. Uh, the script develops as you keep shooting, as right. you keep shooting the story. Right. And it's it's a script that you could never write. Right. <laughs> it's like right. you really spend time. I mean, you have to, for a fiction, you have to sit for two, three months, uh, crack your brain and uh, write write the script. But then when you're sh shooting a documentary, the script is being written itself, you know, like... On a so, daily on basis. On a daily basis. And I'm not saying I wouldn't do fiction. I okay. would probably if I really need to do it. Okay. But I, uh, I, I, I really love doing documentaries. And... Yeah, right now I'm doing a documentary about two friends, uh, mm. 
um, who used to do uh, the national happiness survey before mm. but right now um, i'm making them do the do the happiness survey so it's in some way a hybrid between documentary and fiction okay. and through the, through it's a crossover the, yes yes so so through the two friends we meet different people and we kind of uh, enter into different people's life and and we question what does happiness means to them oh and that's it, very yes. that's a very interesting concept we can't <laughs> wait uh, for that uh, documentary feature to come out mm -hmm. uh, hopefully it will be as successful as the next guardian um, before we end the show tell us if there's any young enthusiast, film enthusiast, documentary enthusiast who wants to do this in the future or even currently, what would you tell them? Well, uh, it's, it's difficult to say, uh, but I mean, one advice that I could give to younger filmmakers is that uh, not to get too obsessed with the technique mm. of, of cinema. I sure. think, I think uh, now because we have so much equipment, uh, right. yeah, you have all the gimbals and the DSLRs and the phones, right. we get a little bit too obsessed with, with the technical part of, of cinema. And, and I see that. I mean, yeah. I, you, you look at your social media platforms and there are some of these crazy travel videos or yes. videos with crazy effects and techniques yeah. that makes it just wow and they're yeah. wonderful yeah, yeah and i watch them all the time yeah, because yeah. i try to i try i myself try to keep up with these kind of things but you're right when it comes to the just basic techniques to tell a story yes yes because the storytelling is more important right it's right. It, it, it's Actually, there's no difference between painting and, and, and cinema, right. if, you, if you look at it. Like, so you don't can worry the about the expensive the camera that you yeah. need to get. Don't yeah. worry about that gimbal. Yeah. Don't worry about that crane. Yes. Even if you have just a phone camera yes. and if you have a good story. Yes, you can tell a story. You can tell a story. And the technique is something that you can learn. As you go on. Uh, go on. I mean, you can just go on YouTube and learn everything, right? But storytelling is something that you keep on practicing right. and I think you you should be able to tell good stories and there are a lot of good stories and there are a lot of great ideas also there are a lot of talented uh, young filmmakers here I mean we can see them but I think it's important to focus on the storytelling and and the technique can come afterwards there you have it ladies and gentlemen this has been a talk with the acclaimed award-winning documentary feature filmmaker Mr. Arun Batrai with his film The Next Guardian, you could catch it on Besco Bhutan, Amazon Prime, and Google Play. And this film will also be featured here on BBS. I will give you the timing at a later stage. Arun Bhattrai, thank you so much for being here with us. It's been a wonderful talk. Thank you very much.